Please fasten your seatbelts for takeoff. <laughs> in through, <coughs> into the deep insides. Sometimes that people ask me a very good question is, now what can you believe? What can you trust in life? Because sometimes that uh, even you look at magicians, a magician can create illusions and tricks and you think, how the heck could they actually do that? And I recall that, uh, again one of the our common friends when I was in Cambridge, she was the head of the Psychic Research Society there, <coughs> a Dr. Tony Cornell. And every now and again, whenever there was a big ghost event uh, in the UK anywhere, he would I'd always see him writing the report and it will be reported in the newspapers, in, even in Australia. And because he was a you know, very good friend of mine, and of you know, Jeff and, uh, uh, what was his name? Bernard. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to give her some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, that uh, I always remember reading an article which she wrote and he said whenever he did go to do any investigations he'd always take a professional magician along with him who knew all the tricks, all the way that you could deceive people. And that made me start thinking all the other stuff which happens in our life. Now are we imagining this? Are we being deceived? all the ideas which we have and we believe because our authorities tell us it's true. Basically, how can we know that what we see, what we hear, what we smell, taste and touch and even what we know with our mind is real and true? And that's especially the case, you know, when you get into, you know, the meditation. You can see some images in there and some weird stuff. And, is this real or is this false? What's going on? <coughs> And, they, fortunately, there is a very powerful psychology which came from the Buddha 2500 years ago. He called that the uh, distortions of the cognitive process. He called it whippalazas. And the whippalazas are when, suppose you have a certain view. Now this we can start at uh, any of these, these three things a certain view that Buddhism is the best. The best and only religion, the greatest path. And that of Buddhism, Theravada is the supreme. Of Theravada, the forest tradition is the supreme. The, the supreme. <laughs> and the Ajahn Brahm's interpretation is the acme of the supreme, of the best. <laughs> Some people actually believe that. Now if you start with that view, you will find that any perceptions, raw data which come up into your mind trying to prove the opposite, or which actually show the opposite, you will not see them, you will deny them. It doesn't make any sense to you. It can't be true, because I already know my faith is unshakable in whatever. So it's actually your views, they do distort perception. I already gave one example of that, of the flower pot. A more common example of that is people falling in love. And I started remembering in those days that when you would go again chasing girls, not chasing them, sometimes they were chasing me, actually we chased each other, to be honest. <laughs> but whenever we'd go out for a romantic time, it'd always be a romantic evening, never a romantic midday. <laughs> and we'd either go to a candlelit dinner, and that was really way up there in romance. Or a, a walk by the river under the moonlight. Is that romantic? 
Oh, hey, what other? Like, like a dance in a nightclub or, or some evening venue. And then I tried to wonder, why was it that you'd only fall in love in dark places? <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite, quite obvious because imagine under the, <laughs> under the moonlight, you couldn't really see clearly what you were falling in love with. <laughs> under the shimmering candle flame, oh, that your girlfriend looked pretty ordinary during the midday. But under the, <laughs> and the same, she looked at me and I was really, really hot and strong and, and handsome, you know, under the flickering light of a disco. <laughs> Because there, she would see what she wanted to see. Something to fulfill her romantic dreams. The dream man. That's supposed to be me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the dream... But isn't it true now, it's just making a little bit of a funny story there, but why is that? It is because, you know, we have certain wants and dreams, things we want to see. And this is actually which brings up our, our distortion of reality. We want it to work out, we want it to be, be happy. We're not really real because of wanting. And then later on in the life, you know, when we have trouble in our relationship, when we file for divorce. <laughs> why, why did I fall in love with that? <laughs> that guy's hopeless. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice when you have like funny laughter. It encourages me though. <laughs> <laughs> of course, my perception is all my stories are incredibly profound and extremely funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's my delusion. <laughs> but what happens is the, the you know, sometimes we get really negative. And bring into um, play here that great story of the two bad bricks and the wall. And that was one story which that did such a lot for people to understand that yes, you make a mistake in life or in meditation or somewhere. You know, there's two bad bricks and a wall. This first wall which I laid <laughs> was a monk when I was in Australia. And I wanted to destroy that wall. I literally wanted to get some dynamite. I asked, <coughs> the mic was with me, I jumped up to it. Can I afford some dynamite to blow the wall up so I could start again? I was literally embarrassed. The first thing I'd ever built, and it really messed up. And not only that, it was public, everyone could see it. And I was so ashamed. And I do recall, I'm pretty sure this is not exaggeration, I recall having nightmares. You'd wake up at night, sweat. I made a mistake. And I, <coughs> I couldn't have fixed it up. And it took a while before someone came, as the old story goes, and I saw that brick wall with that fellow who was with me, and he just happened to say casually, oh, that's a very beautiful wall. And I just couldn't believe what he said. I said, can't you see the two bad bricks? And he said, yes, but I can also see the 998 good bricks. It was my ill will, my wanting to be a perfectionist, and life never been good enough, and always down upon myself, which actually made me look at the faults, instead of the 998 good bricks. And you know, the guy was right, I was the one who was wrong. There were beautiful bricks in that wall, and all I could see is my mistakes and my faults. Do you resonate with that? Sometimes it could be a relationship you have with your partner. And why is it they make one or two mistakes and we want to split up? Why is it that in even our, our career, one or two mistakes and then we just don't want that career anymore? Sometimes that we are so negative, we focus on the negative. And there's always back bricks on the wall because I recall telling that story oh, so many years ago to a cancer group. And afterwards, people are very kind. This uh, fellow came up to me afterwards and said, I'm a builder. 
Ajahn Brahm, look, please don't feel bad about making two mistakes as a bricklayer. They're all bricklayers make mistakes. Every one. Even the ones which I hire and work for me for such a long time, said this, said this builder. But then the builder added this beautiful ending. And I really embraced this and thought, yeah, what a great story this, a great end to the story of the two bad bricks it makes. He said, yeah, everyone makes mistakes, every builder uh, lays a few bad bricks. But, he said, in the industry we always tell our clients that those mistakes are features. <laughs> and we charge our clients an extra couple of thousand dollars for them. And I thought, what a wonderful ending to that story it is. What was supposed to be a mistake, something which I wanted to get rid of, actually was a feature which made it unique, which made it stand out and you looked at it a different way and there's only one wall like that which has that feature. Isn't that wonderful, beautiful? Look at the great mistake the builders made in, uh, in Italy with the Tower of Pizza <laughs> well, not pizza, it's not a pizza hut, <laughs> pizza. Imagine if they had a good builder on that job and it was straight. Oh, they would have lost a lot of money in that tower, hardly any tourists. Because that made it unique, the leaning tower of pizza. So sometimes we look upon mistakes and we're in denial of them because we don't see their value. It's cool, ill will. We look at ourselves, I'm not good enough. There was <coughs> sorry, an interesting anecdote, because I've been teaching Nimittas and Jhanas for many years now, and that when I started you know, talking about Nimittas to people, seeing beautiful lights in the mind, a lot of times people would come up to me and say, well I saw this light, but you know, I couldn't have been a Nimitta. And then I investigated, asked them, and 95% of the time, it is a Nimitta. Sometimes I say 99%, 95%, but you know, most of the time it's a nimit. It really is. But what was really interesting me, why is it that people doubt it and deny it? Why is it they get something beautiful and they think, <coughs> no, it can't be, when it is. There's a type of sort of negativity, I can't do this, you know, this is brilliant stuff, you know, not me. So there is a little negativity there which actually distorts your perception. Which means it can't be true. And of course, you may have noticed, I was just talking about the first two hindrances. Wanting and um, denial, basically. Can't be, it will, can't be. And then you find that those are the two main things which distort reality. I mentioned a little bit about that also when a number of people, even recently, were telling me that as Vietnamese refugees after the, the second, after the Vietnam War, they were in a boat, they were just um, starving, robbed, they were raped by Thai pirates mostly, and that they were just at the end. And that's when they saw there's something shimmering coming over the waves and they, they swear it was Kuan Yin. And then afterwards it turned into a, a British frigate from Hong Kong to rescue them. There's so many people that they have had near-death experiences. And they go towards the light and it is, it is Jesus come to rescue them or whatever. So many times that people say that and you listen to them and they are totally convinced but that perception was what they saw. And obviously, for anyone who knows about just the way perception works, your views are what you interpret perception with. Your perceptions aren't raw, aren't sort of natural, that you can rely upon them. Even your very perceptions have been twisted, bent, to fit your views. Or you might say, faith. And from that I had this little, <laughs> little um, saying, which wasn't original at Champagne. There are two types of religions or philosophies. Those which bend the truth 
to fit their faith, or those which bend their faith to fit the truth? Which one are yours? We always say, oh yeah, we're the ones who, we bend our faith to fit the truth. <laughs> the facts. Everyone says that, and half of them are wrong. I will now uh, prove that to you. You can actually, if ever you give a talk or a lecture somewhere, if it's an office or just for fun or somewhere, be honest. I mean really honest now. How many of you feel you're above average intelligence? <laughs> Come on, put your hand up. If you feel you're above average intelligence. <laughs> okay, about three or four people put their hands up. The other people thought they were above about average intelligence, but you didn't want to show it. <laughs> but the truth is that half of you must be below average intelligence, half above average intelligence, because that's what average means. <laughs> Not me, I'm above average intelligence. <laughs> Again, that's more wishful thinking, isn't it? <laughs> so, a lot of times we just bend the truth, and it's natural. But, once you recognise that, your views, Bend the uh, perceptions, and from your perceptions, that's where you build up your thinking. That was Kuan Yin, I saw it. I am above average intelligence, but you know, just so I can get the degrees out and this out and that out. In fact, I was so intelligent, I didn't even bother with degrees. <laughs> <laughs> you can convince yourself. So that's the trouble with, with views. Uh, bend perceptions, which are the, the bricks of the houses of thoughts which we live in, and it's the thoughts which we enforce the views. It's a cycle. And once you see that, you wonder, how much of this can you trust? Your beliefs, your views, even your perceptions. Are you actually seeing this? And sometimes uh, when you see hypnotists at work, Oh, they really sort of mess up your mind. Is this real or is this not real? How can I imagine already when you can actually touch the skin with an ordinary uh, room temperature nail and you can get a burn up? A really physical injury. How on earth can that happen? So, sometimes though we have this amazing doubt what's true, what's not true. And that can very much totally disorientate you. So we don't go into this easily. And we don't know what's real and what's fake. So what we can do is understanding that those first two hindrances, more than anything else, which bend the truth. So our job in meditation to find or to philosophy or religion the search for meaning, the search for truth. First job is to try and suppress those hindrances. So we don't see what we want to see. We don't deny what is right in front of our eyes. But we suspend those two and just see. That is much harder than you think. Because it's challenging sometimes. It's scary sometimes. It's really hard to actually to accept the truth. So one of the first things we do to allow people to accept, you know, the real life. I know that sometimes people say, you monks and nuns don't live in the real world. And I just, I just react to that. I say, monks and nuns do not wear wigs, we don't dye our hair. We don't have breast implants, we don't use Botox, we don't use deodorants, we don't live in air-conditioned um, uh, palaces when we go shopping centres. So sometimes I have to go to shopping centres to do some sort of business. That really is a fake world. When we die, we just die. We don't go to the other side. We don't uh, pass over. We die. <laughs> D-I-E, die. <laughs> Not sanitized. 
So sometimes, you know, what is the real world? <laughs> I don't know if I told that story, but anyway, when I, oh, just uh, a couple of months ago, I went to the DMZ in between the careers, that's another story also, <coughs> all together. And uh, when I was going to the customs at Perth Airport, the guy just asked me, you know, when you put your bags through the, through the uh, x-ray, see if you've got any contraband inside. He said, sir, um, have you got any uh, hair gel inside your bag? <laughs> 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 Come off me. <laughs> Unfortunately, he laughed, I laughed, and I just shared that, shared that story with lots of people. And Mike having hair gel inside his bag. <laughs> what would I use it for? <laughs> Come on. But anyhow, <laughs> that a lot of times that when uh, we want to find the truth, we have to be courageous because the truth is scary. Sometimes it tells us what we don't want to see. That maybe you've invested all your life in a particular path, religion, philosophy or no philosophy. And you find it doesn't stack up. Are you strong enough, courageous enough? to abandon it, to get something better. Very few people can do that. We've been doing this for too long a time, so it's easier, so we think, to actually just to stay stupid. Do you really want to be wise? Wise wisdom comes with responsibilities and also having to change things. Do you really want that? So anyway, it's letting go of the five hindrances, especially the first two is where we find insight. Insight we can trust. Reading books, you just read the books you want to read. Translations, you go through all the different translations of this book and that book, and you find the one, ah, yeah, that's the best translation, because that's the one which suits me. I don't have to do anything. It's not challenging. So that's why on these retreats, it's not telling you what you already know. It's not just repeating what you can find in another book. It's not just affirming just your comfort zone. It goes deeper. That is why it's a challenge. But, <coughs> you would never be able to do that unless it was fun. Sometimes the, the fear, how can we overcome this fear? It's not just the search for truth and the commitment to find out no matter what. Sometimes it's the joy, the satisfaction of actually finding out what this life is all about and who you are and what's going on inside. That is very delightful. I don't know if any of you... Oh, it's, um, I remember just a documentary which I did see when I was visiting my mother once. It was a BBC documentary about Francis Crick and uh, James Watson, the ones who cracked the, uh, the genetic code, or actually found out you know, what a gene is, uh, <coughs> DNA. And apparently it was very accurate. The reason I watched that, because that was sort of in, uh, in the Cavendish in Cambridge. So I knew the area and knew, you know, uh, Professor Pippard, who was the head of the uh, Cavendish at the time. And anyway, it was obviously many years before, before <coughs> I was there, but I remember the image, or the, the scene, in which they finally got it, they cracked it. You know, the, you know the, the, how a gene, uh, an RNA, sorry, the, the, the DNA of a genome, actually, why it split, but why it was also stable. And, and that scene there, not just the joy, but it was Francis Crick who was dancing you know, down King's Parade you know, from the Cavendish to the pub, I forget what the pub was dancing, just so much joy and happiness, it was bliss he'd actually seen something and got something and all fat together, the why was, was uh, penetrated so sometimes when you do actually see it, ah yes, now I understand that is joyful, that is a bliss. Insight is always real insight. It's always accompanied 
with bliss and happiness. That is just with um, like physics and science, the meaning of that type of life. When it comes to meditation and the meaning of like, who you are and how you work and where you come from, where you go, <coughs> what is this body, this mind, this is actually where it takes courage. Sometimes there is a word in Pali, some of you know this, it's called wiriya. It's usually translated as effort. <coughs> and you know, you've heard me long enough now, is I really just uh, reject sort of effort. It's not that I'm lazy, but you have a, I've worked very hard in life, you know, building monasteries, staying up late. But there's something about that word effort which just reinforces our sense of self, of who we are. And you find that those people who strive a lot, they build up a huge ego. It is the effort, the striving, which makes our sense of self. The doing is what creates an ego, a me. So, that's not what fear means. Fear comes from another word, fear which is a hero. Like they have the leader of the chains, who was, you know, amazingly, he was contemporary to the Buddha. Two great teachers in the same vicinity started big religions, still existing today, living at the same time, in the same locality. But anyway, the Mahavira was so called because the great hero and it was someone, a hero, was someone who was willing to sacrifice everything for whatever cause they were fighting. Whether it was the search for truth or to conquer some uh, neighbouring kingdom. It was the sacrificial part which I was focused on. Because real heroics take a lot of letting go, renouncing one's comfort, one's assets, one's sense of security, being able to let go of everything. And that's a hard thing to do. Except when you find out that the more you renounce, the happier you are. I've already mentioned about you know, stuff, material. I'm never, <coughs> never so happy, you know, materially. And I'm just wandering through Thailand with my bowl, my mosquito nut umbrella, and a bag, nothing else. Knowing I could always get food somewhere, not the best food, but get some arms food the next day, sleep anywhere, and just have no destination, nothing calling me, nothing asking me to go left, right, or anywhere. Totally free. That was a wonderful feeling. The joy of simplicity. Sometimes you see just in our homes. Even this morning I came in early at five o'clock. I didn't want to sort of turn on any lights, just felt my way from the door into here. And just I bumped into so many cushions and a stool and a chair as I came in. And that reminded me just why there's so much stuff in our world. We bump into stuff all the time go to some people's houses and they're so packed, crammed with stuff. And it's hard even in uh, monasteries where I'm supposed to be the boss. People always come in and leave stuff on the shrine. It's an offering to the Buddha. So why don't you offer space, emptiness to the Buddha? Or, you know, giving Venerable Chandra and I gifts of chocolate. They're trying to find out what you like. And they give it to you. No, don't need anything. I mentioned, if you want to give me a gift, a nice box of emptiness. Put it in there. So, Merry Christmas, Ajahn Brahm, what you always wanted. Ah, nothing. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's going against something, isn't it? You always have stuff. Simplicity. So, after a while, same within your, your mind, or your spiritual attainments. What have you got? These days it becomes just 
spiritual materialism, and this <laughs> this is a, one of my favourite stories. Only about two or three years ago, I was told this when I was uh, visiting San Francisco. A Sri Lankan fellow told me this story that um, over in Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka, there was a group of people just doing meditation retreats, just like this one over here. But they also just had some assessment as well. So it was a long retreat, maybe about a whole month. And so, you know, the organisers would watch, see how long you sat, when you got up early in the morning, how you sat, <coughs> whether you were sleepy, interviewed you, kept the notes, gave you some uh, even written exams about, you know, the Dharma, Buddhism, see whether you really understood it. At the end of the retreat, they give you a certificate, see if you passed. <coughs> Especially, not just jhana certificates, but enlightenment certificates. <laughs> and it was uh, getting quite popular for a while. And there was this uh, group of Sri Lankans over in Colombo, and they invited their old auntie, grandma, aunt or something from the villages up country to visit Sri Lanka, also to visit um, Colombo, the capital. <coughs> And she wasn't interested in going shopping or watching cricket or something. So she was a very devout Buddhist. So I said, How can, what gift can we give to our grandma or grand auntie or something, which she would really like? And they thought, we can actually sponsor her for a retreat. So I said, no, auntie, would you like to go on this retreat? Oh yeah, okay. She was a devout Buddhist. So they paid all the money for her, booked her in, sent her to the retreat centre, and there she was meditating and chanting and studying and stuff. At the end of the, the month, the organisers called her up and said, Auntie, we've got some good news for you. We've looked at your progress, we've seen how you were sitting, interviewed you, tested your understanding about the Dhamma and things like non-self and, and uh, impermanence and suffering. We've come to the unanimous conclusion that you, Grandma, are a stream winner, a soul winner. And here's the certificate signed by everybody. Now, if you know Sri Lankan culture, to be a soul one, is it, that's all I want, be a soul one, anything else is like gravy. But she got very angry at them. She started shouting at them. And, Grandma, why are you so angry? Being a screen winner is an amazing achievement. You never go to any lower realms. You're bound to become enlightened. You know, there's no other chance for you. It's a wonderful thing that you've got. You should be celebrating. Even the Buddha said, greater than, than victory over so many lands uh, is actually the attainment of the winner. Well, why are you angry? And she looked at them with, with venom. <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember me, do you? <laughs> Oh, have you been here before? Yes. And last time I was here, you said I was a non-returner. You have now demoted me. <laughs> and that was it. Because a non-returner is actually two stages up. <laughs> That's the trouble with certificate cuts. So they're not accurate. And so anyway, that... A few months later, that place closed down before we got around. It's a scam. So, instead of this, sort of, to actually to let go of stuff, this spiritual attainment is not some place inside of you to pin a medal or hold a hang a certificate. How can you hang a certificate in the sky? Pin a medal in the air when there's nothing to hold it. This is what we're doing. We are vanishing to disappear. Ah! I don't want to vanish and disappear. Ah! I'm not ready for this. Ah! I'm too scared. I don't, I don't want to get mine. Ah! I'm sorry, for most of you it's too late. <laughs> you should have come on a, come on a retreat like this. <laughs> So, what actually happens is, 
You're meditating, similar lotus that opens up. It's fun opening up your lotus. I don't know what's inside. It's really beautiful. It's surprising that you can do that. And that your body can vanish. Oh, where did that go? And it feels good. And it's wonderful. And little sicknesses, they go. You feel healthy. Weird stuff. And even maybe you can remember some past lives. That's really weird. But that tends to sort of an investigation. You know, in through meditation, not even meaning to do it, just these things arise. And it gets incredibly interesting, fascinating and joyful. So after a while, you just go a little bit deeper, and then a little bit deeper. And you find that just doing things like delightful breath, for many people that's just a wonderful way. Relaxed, rested, just watching the breath, going in, breath, going out. A lot of some stillness in my brain. You don't have to worry and and make decisions and decide what's right, what's wrong. Everything becomes really still. And it becomes joyful as well. Even that little insight, which I've shared widely, that real mindfulness has got many different levels to it. Ordinary mindfulness, power mindfulness, superpower mindfulness, blow your mind mindfulness. It gets bigger <coughs> and bigger, more intense, and with it, happiness. That's one of the things which was surprising. The joy of meditation is huge. I never expected a spiritual path could be so blissful, and that you could do it. <coughs> so you meditate, you have a wonderful time. You say, I'm meditating two hours, three hours. We've got, goodness, that's three hours, gone by already. And you never tried, it just happens. Weird stuff, weird story for you. There was a retreat like this in Sydney a few years ago. It was run, led by a, a Vietnamese Theravada monk. I will not say it anymore, because we usually keep these things quiet in case that monk gets harassed by too many people trying to visit him. We started the retreat in the evening. At 7.30 was supposed to be, after an orientation, 7.30, half an hour meditation, 8 to 9, the talk. So everybody went to their orientation, they checked in, got their bags in their rooms, and then at 7.30 they came to meditate, the monk was there meditating. At 8 o'clock there was no bell. He was still meditating. 8.15, hadn't moved. 8.30, 9 o'clock, he hadn't stirred at all. And even though the most of them were very respectful Buddhists, they didn't wait to be dismissed. At 9 o'clock, 9.15, they were off to bed. He was still meditating there. Hadn't given a talk, hadn't done anything yet. <laughs> and they probably went to bed and had the program the following morning up at 5 or something, and then meditation, he was still there, meditating. No morning, a chanting. Seven o'clock, breakfast, he just sat there, didn't move, didn't take any breakfast. He sat there for eight days, not moving, not eating, not going to the toilet, not drinking, just sat there. That's, is that weird or is that cool? <laughs> so anyway, he just did come out of his meditation just the last day of the retreat. And the first thing he did, he apologized. He said, I'm really sorry, I just couldn't really deep meditation. Couldn't come out. Sorry I never gave you any talks. And all the people there, they said, No, no, don't have to say sorry. That was so inspiring. To see such things, see it with our own eyes, that these things are possible in today's world. You can sit there just without moving, eating, drinking, going to the toilet, nothing, just sitting like a Buddha statue. Wow, that was so inspiring. And that was even better than all the information from talks. Weird stuff, really cool stuff, what's possible? And let alone all these amazing things with people's cancer and stuff. And just, I don't know quite how it works, but this, this mind is incredibly powerful. This is one fellow who came on a retreat with me once and he was wearing a rubber face mask. I thought he was some really weird, kinky, 
deviant <laughs> fetish guy or whatever. I've never seen anything like that before. <laughs> so he, he checked in with me and he said that uh, he had this, um, I wanted it when you have a rash all over yourself. So I said, yeah, over that. Thank you again. So, you know, it's good to get you to do some work as well, because <laughs> over here there's something we say in England and all over the world, there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> so, no, thank you, General. So, so I was all over his body, and I've never seen anything so gross. <laughs> because he said he had to wear the mask to stop him scratching his skin off. It was 24 7. And, you know, he lifted up his trousers, it was all over his legs. Open his shirt, it's all over his body. I'm, I said, that's enough, don't have to show him now, anywhere else. But he said every square millimetre of his body he had this rash, it was driving him mad. Doctors, psychologists, everyone had helped him. So they said, try meditation. But nothing to this. And so he said, look, if I have to wear this mask, it's, you know, it's not being offensive, is it? And if I just don't stay for any of your talks, it's only not because I don't like them, because ugh, I'm just so restless. But good on him, he stayed the whole nine days. And I always remember at the end of the nine days, he came to see him with this huge smile on his clear face. Huge joy. He said, it's gone. And he opened up his shirt, whole shirt off. See, nothing left there. I wonder what he's going to do next. <laughs> <laughs> he just lifted up his trousers, but not taking them off. And there was a band about an inch wide around those ankles. Do you see that? That's the, all that's left. Just that. That would drive most people mad, but that is all that's left. You know, it's, it's, this is nothing now. Thank you so much. You know, you're taking him out of a hell and giving him some freedom. But I didn't do that, it's just meditation. He just, I don't know what he did, but certainly it worked. That sort of stuff is weird. But when you see it with your own eyes, that's just beautiful. I don't know why, who cares why, the fellow was free of so much suffering. So this is where you, know, you have to be able to see weird stuff and actually suspend some of your ideas of what's possible, what's not possible. So you sit there <coughs> and your body vanishes. Nothing wrong with your body vanishes, but you're perfectly aware that inside, beautiful, delightful breath, and that becomes this incredible, powerful limiters, bliss upon bliss. And you remember sort of some of the stories of you know, people like um, St. John of the Cross just blissing out. People go into ecstasy states when they were in a religious transportation, I think they're called, transport of delight. People finding other blisses and happiness, and that's you. You're experiencing it. These things which those monks and nuns and Buddhas said are real. And that just blows you away. You experience it, wow. But it's really scary. It does have consequences. When you see that sort of stuff, it changes the way you look at the world. So you go deeper in. What's happening now is you know that this can't be fake. Because you're going so deep in the meditation, your wants and your ill will denial is disappearing. Mm. If it's not all gone. There's Ajahn Bamali, I just do listen to him, and he sometimes puts it in a beautiful way, he said the whole purpose of meditation is actually to weaken and then suppress and then turn off the five hindrances, which stop you seeing truth. And once those are gone, you know they're gone because you're next to jhana, the, what they call last night Upachara, neighborhood. And uh, many people these days, you know, they've taught and they've got some sort of understanding, they think, oh, this must be Upachara. This must be Jhanas. 
Unfortunately, most times it ain't. People get upset at that. If it's a jhana, real jhana, number one, you cannot think. No way, thinking is so gross. You are so still. And you're bliss, you can't feel the body. It's not like the body is a long distance away, it's not there. You can't feel it. <laughs> Mosquitoes, obviously they're gone. Here's one story for you, weird stories which I like. A lay person, good old Greg, his name was. He was a, he was a meditator, a good man, but he would only usually meditate half an hour, that's all. And one afternoon, Sunday afternoon, nothing on TV. Of course there's something on TV, but he's bored. So he went into his bedroom to meditate. <coughs> After an hour, his wife came to check on him. He was still meditating, really still. Very still. Too still. Couldn't see his <coughs> chest move at all. No sign of breathing. And she freaked. She called ambulance. Zero, zero, zero in Australia. And the ambulance came within a few minutes. And the medics rushed into the bedroom, checked for any breath, checked for pulse, no pulse discernible. Straight into the, the back of the ambulance with his wife dragging <coughs> along. Rushed to the hospital. Da, 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 making a lot of noise. When they got to the hospital, it was a Sunday afternoon. Not many people there, thank goodness. And the triad took one look at him and put him into the emergency department, whatever, and put on an ECG and an EEG. Both flatlined. He was dead. According to what they thought, first look, there wasn't no heartbeat, no sort of brain activity, both flatlined. Wife was freaking out, and he was having the time of his life. <laughs> he said, never had so much bliss and stillness ever. So, already gave the game away that he survived this. So what did the doctor do? And this is what uh, he said his wife was in attendance did at the time. They didn't inject <coughs> um, the, uh, what's it called, uh, adrenaline. They actually did defibrillator to try and get his heart going again. Many times they put defibrillator, electric shock. And I have seen this on a documentary. It, your, your back arches up. It's very violent. He didn't feel any of that. He was just having this nice peaceful time. So if you say you get disturbed by a door slamming, <laughs> that's not Charles. He's got to defibrillate or something. <laughs> and, so if you want to check if you've got a jhana or not, I think there's a few defibrillators here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> check it. <laughs> then, sort of, in the end, I mean, the only reason why the doctor didn't send him to the morgue, apparently, immediately, because the doctor was Indian. And he'd heard from his parents, so, you know, these sadhus, and they go to these really deep states of suspending all your life faculties while you did meditation, and so he thought, well, the wife said he was meditating. No real history, or a medical history of anything wrong with him. So that's why I kept on putting defibrillators on. And then he, he told me, just he decided, oh, time to come out. And he opened his eyes, and he actually bent up, opened his eyes, where am I? <coughs> and as soon as he decided to come out of his meditation, beep, 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 everything was back to normal again. The doctor couldn't really understand what was going on. Gave him a thorough checkup. Now, usually, they keep you in overnight for observation. Not here, he was just perfect health. So he walked back with his wife. He walked back home in about 15, 20 minutes. And he said it was a totally pleasant experience, except for one thing. The only thing which was painful was <laughs> the ear bashing he got from his wife on the way home. <laughs> Don't you ever do that again. <laughs> You're bad for meditating. I don't do that. Scare me. I don't <laughs> And that's a true story. 
So I did actually write that in the book with Greg's consent. Checked it out, okay, that's accurate. So, weird amazing stories that challenges how we believe life could be. So anyway, sometimes you get in such a deep meditation. You enjoy the beautiful, delightful limiters. And you just go in. Sometimes the limiters, matter what colours they are, but they get very still, peaceful and brilliant. Really powerful. But, that will only happen if you let them. If you interfere, even in a small way, a tiny way, you disturb them. You have to let go. Big time. And I think I've mentioned that all those people, the first lay people, who got into jhanas with me, I asked them, what did you do special this time? Was it what you ate, how you sat? Was it this type of meditation or that type of meditation? Why did it happen this time? And they all used, <coughs> they all said this time. First, three or four times, almost word for word. They said, I really let go. Really let go. And they said the same old thing. Really let go. So, okay, next meditation, really let go, no, really let go, come on, really let go. Really yeah. let go. <laughs> <laughs> That's not letting go. That's nah, trying to let go, using it as a strategy, more doing. But they actually did, totally abandoned, and it just went quite fast. There was a story, <coughs> thing I have to do, um, number three, uh, deep insight tomorrow, because I'm not going to finish. But there was this lovely novice story. This novice over in Wat Bhagwan years ago. And Ajahn Charles, who lived for nine years, he sometimes he gets amazing Dharma teachings. Sometimes they were just so rubbish. <laughs> I say that because he's my teacher. Out of respect, out of truthfulness. Sometimes, you know, you're on song, you, just like a tennis player or a soccer player, they can do nothing wrong every time they hit the ball, it goes in the goal. And sometimes Ajahn Chah was like that. Sometimes really amazing, sometimes, when's he going to stop? <coughs> and that was one night. He was giving a really awful Dharma talk. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish, no real meaning, heard it before, and no real power to it. But there was a little novice there, it was only about, I can't forget his age, but 9, 10, 11, that sort of age. And he was wondering, said, all these other big monks, they're monks, you know, they're grown up, they can handle, they don't need to go to sleep. Well, I'm a young guy, I need sleep, I need to go to bed. But of course, it was very, very disrespectful to get up while Ajahn Chah was giving a talk and go to bed. So he had to stay there, <laughs> stay there and stay there. And he started repeating this mantra to himself, when is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? <laughs> Apparently the kids in the car sometimes get the mantra, are we there yet dad? <laughs> are we there yet mum? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> <coughs> but this uh, little guy was actually saying, when is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? And it became like the old broken record, around and around and around. And then he had like an insight. An insight is just seeing things from a, from a unique way, a different way. And he thought, when am I going to stop? And he stopped. When he opened his eyes, all the monks had left the hall. It was morning. This was the night time to talk. It was morning, he missed his arms round, blissed out of his little head. He hadn't heard anything. He really got into one of the lovely deep meditations. He stopped. It's a beautiful little story. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. But he stopped. This mind went into his wonderful deep states. So, why? Just for fun, so you could sit for eight days and waste time? So you could actually avoid listening to Ajahn Chah any longer? Is that the whole point of it? Not quite. Because once those five hindrances are gone, then you start to understand things. 
your courage, you does not what you want to say, not what you deny, you start to say what is really there. But first of all, there's many similes <coughs> which I try to develop. And one of those similes, one of my favourite ones, is the uh, I can do a couple of similes. One of them was the the donkey and the carrot. I told the donkey and the carrot. I told, when I, I told that somewhere. Only in the interview. Very interview. Okay. The donkey and the carrot simile. Because in Europe, <coughs> old days, we used to have donkey carts. Maybe sometimes. Well, maybe not in these days, but seeing maybe in southern Europe, uh, <coughs> sometimes you see donkey carts. And we still have the saying, as stubborn as a donkey. Because if a donkey doesn't want to pull a cart, it won't. And you can get a stick and you can beat that donkey, the donkey won't move. But that's not how you use a stick on a donkey. What you do is you tie the stick to the donkey's neck. So the front of the stick is about two feet in front of the donkey's head. On the end of the stick, you tie a string. On the end of a string, a carrot. I use this story in many different places. When I use it in Asia, especially in Malaysia, Singapore, I say they tie a piece of durian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As Asian donkeys like durian. Maybe in Sri Lanka, and in Sri Lanka tea bag. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a mango or something. Whatever. In Europe, a nice juicy carrot. And the donkey sees a carrot two foot in front. Donkeys like carrots, so they move towards the carrot. As the donkey moves towards the carrot, the carrot moves away from the donkey. Because the stick moves, the string moves. <coughs> so the donkey starts running after the carrot. Sometimes it gets a little bit closer, but still the carrot is always a couple of feet in front of the donkey's head. Just like your life. Meaning, satisfaction, happiness, health, perfect relationship, nice job. Has ever felt to you, it's right in front of you. You can almost see it. You can almost smell it. You go towards it and it goes away from you. Just like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You see it, but it's always just out of reach. Happiness, meaning, success, whatever you're seeking. But the donkey learns the Dhamma. That's why, ever since Buddhism came to Europe, we can't have donkey carts anymore. They figured out how to catch the carrot. And it's so obvious, once you know, donkey runs like hell after the carrot. Fast as he can, really fast, but still the carrot is two foot in front. What does the donkey do next? Stops. Stops. What happens to the carrot? It goes further away. Have you ever tried the meditation which I have been teaching and actually followed instructions? Let go, don't do anything. Fall asleep. Thought, thoughts come up, don't try and stop them, just let them go. I get more thoughts that jump up. The carrot is going further away. Further away than it usually is. What do you do? Oh, this can't be working. So you're not patient enough to let it work. You start interfering and striving again. But if you follow the instructions, like the, the smart donkey, yeah, he stops. The carrot moves further away. Further away. Fur it's never been that far away. Your meditation is totally hopeless, mm -hmm. you say, because it's not working. It's usually much better than this, but now I'm asleep, restless, you know, not really meditating at all. My carrot's just so far away. But <coughs> the donkeys do have a bit of faith and patience, they wait. And when the carrot's four foot in front of the donkey's mouth, it starts coming towards the donkey. That has never happened before. That is weird. It's a long way away, but you can start watching your breath. <coughs> Easy. You get delightful breath. The carrot is coming closer, and it's happening quite fast. It's inimitous, how inimitous. Ooh, how did that happen? I didn't do anything. I didn't try. I didn't put effort in. Got beautiful limited. And soon that carrot is the same distance, two foot in front of the donkey's mouth, and now comes at top speed towards the donkey. And the 
drunkard just sits there, incredible nimitz and jhanas, and the drunkard's not doing anything, just sitting there, stop, not moving. And soon the carrot gets so close to the donkey's mouth that the donkey remembers the most important final instruction, metta, kindness, compassion. How often do we forget kindness, compassion in our path of meditation? And so just as the carrot comes really close, the donkey remembers and says to the carrot, carrot, the door of my mouth is open to you. <laughs> Otherwise the carrot bounces off its teeth. So close to enlightenment, forgets compassion. Okay, open up. <laughs> you get inside, that's how things happen. Chasing carrots. You stop, and the carrot comes towards you. I didn't mention that simile. Ajahn Chah, under the um, mango orchard. The mango's parted by the Buddha. Only way you can get the mango, sit perfectly still, open your hand, and it comes. So what many people do, I tried that Ajahn Chah. I sit here, perfectly still, open up my heart, nothing comes. <laughs> That's enlightenment. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> You're missing. <laughs> but not only that, you say, when's it going to come? Come on, I haven't got all day, you know. There's no, how many days left of this retreat? Come on, I'm sitting here. No, four. Now. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to offer my money back. I think I've already mentioned to you that on this retreat, because I always say, guarantee, because I'm very honest, man, if you don't get anything out of this retreat, you are allowed to ask for your money back. <laughs> and I will make sure that you are allowed to ask. <laughs> You've heard it before, you won't get it back. He was allowed to ask. <laughs> That's marketing. I should have been in business. <laughs> anyway, uh, where we go? The other simile, a very wonderful simile, is Without the jhanas, can you really understand things? It's not only the fact you have the courage, the strength, and the open mind, you're not so distorting the truth to fit yourself, but also the data. There's the old tadpole and the frog simile. Once there was a little tadpole, and she grew up, she was born in a little pond in the temple grounds. And being a little tadpole in the temple grounds, you know, she was very inspired, she would hear the monks chant and the nuns, and she would listen to the Abhidharma. So she became very, very knowledgeable about Dhamma. And there was even in that little, mon little tadpole's uh, pond, there was a little school. And so she went to school, she went to primary school in the late she went to the secondary school, did her O-levels and A-levels in science and she was so smart she got a scholarship you know, inside the little pond to go to university to study chemistry and uh, eventually she got a, a degree in chemistry and a PhD in water studies. <coughs> so she was an expert on water and she even just wrote a thesis on water. And she used some of the things she heard from the people talking about the four elements, especially the water element and the Abhidharma on water. So she was absolutely the expert on water. But how could little Tadpole really know what water is? She was born in the water, lived all her life in the water, knew nothing except, nothing other than being inside the water. No more than a fish could understand what water is when you're born in the water, lived in the water all your life. But well, the difference between little tadpole and the fish is that one day little tadpole grew appendages. She noticed something growing on the bottom and then her uh, uh, sides. There were the arms and legs. She was changing into a frog. But she didn't have a guidebook on what she's supposed to do as a frog. But one day she didn't really know what she was doing and she jumped. She was on dry land. She was outside of the lake for the first time. 
And that was weird. Nothing like she'd ever experienced before. Try that. <coughs> now, and only now, she could understand what water is. Or rather what water was. That strange stuff which is no longer there. How could you know what your body is? You may be a top doctor, anatomist, cut up bodies, heal bodies, but ever since you can remember, you've been in a body <coughs> with its five senses. How the heck do you think you can know what these are? Thing you do. You can be a psychologist, psychiatrist, examine them all, a neuroscientist. But all that time, these five senses have been operating. But then one day, you come on a retreat and you gain appendages, the jhanas. Just like two legs and two arms, four jhanas. And you don't know, really want to know what you're doing, but one day, you, you jumped. You're not in the five sense world anymore. You're in jhana land. And that is weird. That is so different than anything you've ever experienced before. So weird. So weird that you can't even assess it. You assess it when you come out. What the heck was that? But the nice thing about jhanas is they're incredibly powerful. There's, we haven't got a word for this, it's so easy to recall. If you had a trauma, car crash, sort of anything, that remains with you. All those very, very strong memories are usually the very negative ones. But this is entirely positive, but even more intense. So you can't really forget it. You're out. That was weird. What was that? And one of the things you recall is what's missing. If ever you get a real jhana that is totally different, totally different than anything you've ever experienced before, when you emerge, try not to ask what was that, but try to inquire what was missing, what had disappeared, what that was always there, you could never notice it, what is now gone. And that's where in the first jhana, your body, the five senses. We were chehi kamehi. You're totally separated from the five sense world, from the body and stuff. It's not there anymore. And it pushes you out. Free from that rubbish of bodies and senses. And then we had the second jhana. That is really freaky. You come back afterwards and you think, what was, what was this missing? Your will, or rather the will. Do you know what the will is? Who chose to come here on this retreat? Who decided to write things down in the book? Who decided to actually to make me a cup of tea this morning? Who did that? You always think it's you, because that's always been there for you. It's always there, so you don't really notice it. You may try and be mindful of it, but you're not really. But when it vanishes and disappears, the will is totally gone. Then you get some idea what it is. And that's quite shocking. To realise this will, which you're trying to be protected, and trained, and cherish, that is the problem. Still, no will. That's why you're incredibly still. Scary, because the will is a fundamental part of who you think you are. I am the one who does stuff. I need to do stuff. I'm in control. Don't anyone tell me I'm not. Sorry guys, girls. You're not in control. I'm out of here quick. <coughs> I've been playing with spiders and well. I know this. Bird. That is really scary, but it's true. So once you have abandoned your <coughs> things which distort insight, when you see these things, ooh, what do I be? Just like the simile, 
Last time you'll be free. I do promise. <laughs> I promise, but some people don't keep my promises. <laughs> Because they're not mine. I'm out of control. <laughs> I'm very consistent with my teachings and my actions. <coughs> they, oh, I've actually forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> About the will, decisions, I'm going to hell. Okay, enough. <laughs> 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 <laughs>